Hi, my name is John Vion. I'm the uh, PhD student on the Integrated Wetland Management Project here at uh, UC Davis. And we're at Birdhaven Ranch, which is about a 3,000 acre uh, waterfowl hunting club owned by Paul Bonderson, who is a former Ducks Unlimited president. He is the primary funder for this project. And essentially today we'll be going out and collecting some mosquito and uh, predatory macroinvertebrate data uh, from the wetlands. And then we're at uh, one of our, uh, what we call a treatment unit. So one of the units we have implemented our uh, new management regime uh, to that technically uh, finds a compromise between uh, mosquito control and then also habitat uh, management for waterfowl and other wetland species. What we just took was a D-ring net sample so to collect a lot of your macroinvertebrates, they either hang out towards the soil or bottom to middle tier of the water column. So essentially you take this net and you touch it on the bottom and then bring it up a little bit and then you do three swoops and then bring it up. And so it lets all the water out and contains all the bugs and uh, plant matter and algae matter. And then what we do is we fill a pan with a little bit of filtered water. Now what we'll do is we'll jar it up. Everything so. We'll pour it up here and then we always put a card with the location information uh, the sample type so we call this one the pond center sample um, and this is the second irrigation so we put the second irrigation on here as well as the date kind of the uh, general history behind uh, the project and some of the purpose for doing this is back in 2004 they had developed some best management practices for mosquito control in wetlands um, and kind of the traditional wetland is about a, a four to ten day irrigation but you know it's difficult to get water on and off in four days so you know up to about ten days was this compromise um, for keeping water on um, but there's not necessarily you know there, there's different management regimes that you can try with in, in those styles of wetlands and that's typically what the valley would have used. Um, so a lot of what we're comparing to is a 10 day irrigation in, in wetlands that may not necessarily have a method to how they're engineered. The wetland we're standing in right now uh, is essentially what we call a treatment wetland. So it's the wetland that we're trying our new wetland management regime uh, to hopefully control mosquitoes uh, in and build up macroinvertebrate uh, bugs, not only as predators of mosquitoes, but also uh, as a potential food resource for wet, other wetland wildlife uh, species. So what we have here essentially in the treatment is you've got uh, essentially uh, swales that are basically the divots or canals that carry the water from the northern end where the pump usually is that either pumps well water or slew water in to the unit. Um, and that carries it all the way down. So in the treatments, you usually have a central swale. You might have some side swales, but not as many as in your, your other control wetlands. Um, but you do have backfill swales. So once the water comes all the way down, it'll start to backfill back out. And you can, you'll be able to see that eventually uh, on the sides there. Um, but what we're standing in right now is what we call the predator pond. So the idea is that you've, you've got that grade. So we call it a 3% grade. So you've got inches of water at the top and you've got several feet of water at the bottom. The idea is the pond is that you've got a larger area of water so that when uh, it's the period between the irrigation uh, where we're not irrigating the entire unit, we draw the water back into the swale and the pond. So the idea is that the uh, predatory macroinvertebrates or the macroinvertebrate food base will collect in here and have a place to hang out and continue to con uh, or continue to live out their life cycles and life stages. And then the other idea is that with that slow movement and receding of water, because mosquito larvae have a hard time swimming, they kind of squiggle, they don't like a lot of movement and they'll try to hang in the vegetation. The idea is that you're actually drawing those mosquito larvae back into the swales and down to the predator pond. So you've got uh, the the movement of the swale water into the predator pond and then you're also concentrating a lot of those uh, a lot of those predators before we completely board it up and hold the water in the swale. Essentially what we do now is uh, we use the, the dip cup to collect the mosquito larva off uh, the top of the water column. So essentially we'll just dip it in uh, and collect a sample but we do that every three paces uh, ten times and that's one mosquito dip sample. Yes, yeah, so we have no mosquito larvae in this one. 
you know, in a transect we do 10 dips, but at the fifth one we like to take a vegetation measurement because we're sampling the edge of the vegetation uh, for the most part. And, you know, uh, we'd like to see if there's an influence of the different type of vegetation and the height of the vegetation and the percentage of the coverage. So uh, how much vegetative matter there is um, within the transect, then we'll relate that back to uh, the bugs that we sort in the lab. Percent cover wise, we probably have 20% coverage total. And then uh, of the plant composition, it would be 100% water grass. Uh, I'm Cody Whitlock. I recently graduated from UGA with a bachelor's in ecology and now I'm a technician on the project. I'm AJ Lashway. I recently graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University with a bachelor's in zoology, environmental science, and English. Um, and now I'm a technician on the project as well. So, like I said, these emergent traps, we use these to sample, uh, you know, the bugs are constantly going through life stages out here. Um, so they go from egg to aquatic larva and then some go into a pupa phase and then eventually they emerge, so they emerge out of the, um, uh, out of the water to, into their terrestrial life stage. So the idea of this trap is uh, basically it's a PVC pipe, pool noodle, and wedding veil um, that we built from some plans offline and modified to our use. And we used two Nalgene bottles with the caps drilled out, um, but they're glued together, so essentially uh, there's a hole in here that when the bug emerges out of the water, can fly into the hole in the cup and then, because uh, they want to go towards the pyramid at the top, they want to go towards the, the, uh, the funnel. And they go into the hole and then the alcohol fumes from the ethanol that we have in the bottom of this cup, when they go in the hole, causes them to uh, fall down into the bottom here. So it makes for an easy collection passive method. So we essentially just unscrew the bottom bottle and then we've got our stuff in there and it looks like we've got one terrestrial insect that seems to have emerged and then fell within our trap. So we'll collect this in a cup and then, um, and then we'll take that uh, back to the lab to sort it. All right, we just pour that in there. And we don't have to do as much filtering with this because we actually just use mainly ethanol um, in here. So that's what makes this an easy collection method. Boatman swims like as if he's, um, you know, like he's right side up, but these guys get called back swimmers because they look like they're upside down. Um, but they have a little proboscis that they inject into their prey and pull the contents out. <laughs> so these guys actually can, uh, if you're handling them, um, can actually sting your finger if you're not careful. But um, but yeah, they can get after mosquito larva. All right. The history behind a lot of the uh, wetland issues with mosquitoes in California is really interesting. You know, a lot of there's a lot of states that don't necessarily keep tabs on how much uh, mosquito larvae are within their wetlands, but in California, what's a little different is although we have less wetlands uh, than we used to out here, you've got a lot of urbanization, so you have a lot of potential for m mosquito-borne illness from any body of water that can generate mosquitoes or produce mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes can carry diseases between wildlife, um, even uh, domestic livestock, and as well as humans. So there's a big public health concern from multiple angles. So uh, the state of California implemented an agency called the Mosquito Vector Control Association that's actually governed by county. And they come through, and it can be any body of standing water, um, but wetlands essentially, they'll come through and uh, do the mosquito dipping and test how many uh, mosquito larvae are actually within the wetland. And, and if it's a concern um, or a public health concern, they'll actually fly that wetland with the pesticide. Now, if it reaches a certain threshold, that pesticide is usually charged to the landowner, um, which you know is really important to have that pesticide in some degrees because if we didn't keep mosquitoes at bay, we could have huge public health concerns. So that's the big purpose and importance of having a mosquito vector control agency in a place like this where we have urbanization and surrounding areas. But the downside to wetland management is that, you know, it can, if you're generating a lot of mosquitoes and uh, you are sprayed and charged those fees, it can be difficult to continue to manage your wetlands. So you may not keep them flooded as long. Um, and then also, as a result, there may be downstream consequences to wetland wildlife, not only within the spring, but it could have implications towards the food resources in the fall. 
So the idea behind this whole project and this type of treatment wetland is that we're trying to find a compromise. We're trying to find a way that doesn't necessarily need, is either similar if not better a uh, way to control for mosquitoes within wetlands and maybe generate better uh, wetland uh, species uh, food uh, within the wetland but also the idea is that it might gen it may drive down costs for farmers put more water within uh, the wetlands and also drive down costs for managers but then also from a mosquito vector control standpoint is being able to allocate their resources and their effort to areas that may be of a bigger concern so maybe even closer to more urban areas or maybe you know they have a pilot that flies around um, being able to use his time in a more efficient manager or uh, in a more efficient manner so um, it's all about finding the compromise and figuring out ways that we can manage these wetlands that kind of benefit both parties but also keep that public health concern at bay almost like a folding shovel um, but they have a really interesting mouth that reaches out and grabs things. Um, but you can see him if you look really close, it's like his head's moving around. He's looking, uh, checking out his environment. But they're they're highly predaceous. They can eat a lot of stuff. But some of these uh, dragonfly and damselfly larvae can take, you know, there's some that can take up to three months to develop. Um, they'll crawl up on top of vegetation, shed their, their uh, skin, and out pops a dragonfly, and then they fly off. So we'll put him in our cup. You know, all these wetlands, as I, me and my advisor, John Eady, describe as, you know, these wetlands are like patients. They all have their different characteristics and key features. Some are larger, some are longer, some are shorter. Um, and that may play a role into how the different effects we're seeing uh, between the abundance of mosquitoes and also the abundance of macroinvertebrate predators and potentially the downstream benefits for dietary items for uh, waterfowl and other wetland species. We're hoping to eventually find a way to categorize that um, and look at the relationship with that with different abundance of mosquito larvae and uh, macroinvertebrates um, and macroinvertebrate predators of mosquitoes just to kind of get some hard numbers of how do I build my wetland uh, to maybe control for mosquitoes, if if in fact that we find that there is an effect, um, and hopefully you know that that uh, helps out managers and gives hard concrete numbers, or potentially organizations like Ducks Unlimited that might be able to relay that information to uh, wetland managers. So I guess what we're going to do now is we just wrapped up the pond, and the pond essentially, again, that was that area that we think you know congregates these uh, macroinvertebrate predators and other macroinvertebrates in general. So we consider the swales a little bit different because they're more of a more of a canal that carries the water. So it's not kind of the end point. It's, it's a little bit different. It's continuously moving, but very slowly. Um, so we like to sample them separately. And, and when we go to analyze this data, we'll consider them as a separate area from the pond. Um, but we like to track the effects from the uh, south to the north from the pond because the idea is that with that grade you're going to have more water and deeper water towards the southern end which can have all sorts of implications towards uh, the water quality and maybe the different types of plants and the productivity of those plants uh, could be different down there than towards the northern end where you may get uh, less water, maybe more difficult to maintain water on the north end. So we expect to see these uh, north to south trends. So that's why we do a sampling in the south and a sampling in the north uh, of the swale as well. So uh, we have an emergent trap out there because uh, we also do test for the emergence. So we'll do one transect of a D-net, 10 mosquito dips in a D-net and the emergent sample to see um, are there any difference in effects uh, within the swale versus the uh, the pond area within the water. So that's a ditiscid larva. So those smaller beetles we're seeing, uh, that's what these guys kind of turn into. And you can see there's various other worms in there, but ditiscid larva, they're actually pretty predaceous as well. All right, so now that we're done with the south swale, we'll be transitioning onto the north swale to finish up our transects for the day. We just finished up the 
swale so we've got the pond done and the swales done um, so now what we like to do uh, because the idea with the way the units work and with the mosquito larva is that um, they like to be out of the movement so even though they can't really swim really well in the current they can wiggle to try to get away um, so the idea is that they might try to wiggle into these edges um, the way that the the flux and flow of the wetland uh, works so we like to sample the edges uh, to see if there's any difference in uh, sampling along the edge of the of the wetland um, so we'll and we also try to see if we can uh, detect any in some of the more what we call the more mosquito looking uh, areas so we'll drive around and try and see if we can find some more mosquitoes doing t 10 dips around the predator and then we'll be finished up with the unit Tell we've got a lot of samples. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Echo, I'm the resident entomologist on this project. So I am going to be talking about the identification part of the phase. We've gone over the sorting and processing of the samples, kind of clearing out any debris and leaving it to where it's just insects and petri dishes. Um, thanks to our data from last year, we found that genus is actually kind of like the sweet spot for finding out functional feeding groups, and that's going to provide us with the best data on predator consumption of mosquitoes, which is the main portion of why we're working with bugs on this project. Whenever we come across a new bug in our collection, we try to catalog them. So right now I have a collection of about 50 different insects. Um, so we have a couple of repeats, but they're in different life stages. So I've pulled out a couple little example ones just to see. Um, this right here is a Hydrophilus larvae from the family Hydrophilidae. He's pretty aggressive looking. Um, <laughs> and then we've got our Bilostomatidae, the giant water bug. I, I just have so much fun putting these in samples and then looking at them later. We've got some Coenagrionidae's, which are our damselflies, one of the families that we find out here. Uh, back swimmers, I love these guys, they're so funky looking. And then a big old hydrophilid beetle. It's kind of dark, but this right here is a Dolicopodidae, is a type of fly that we're finding. It's, yeah, the diversity is absolutely incredible. There are some insects I can recognize like right off the bat. Some of them I have to kind of key out and kind of go, what is this? <laughs> Just work through the key to get to where I need to be. But yeah, the diversity is absolutely astounding. So our main purpose to kind of collecting, identifying, sorting, and then cataloging everything just to keep a record of what we see out here and then, of course, seeing what feeds on mosquitoes, what doesn't, how many mosquitoes we're seeing in certain samples versus like control versus treatment, and whether or not the predator ponds are actually having an effect. So that's pretty much the summary of our identification stage. Basically, after this, once we get the, the data in our spreadsheets, you know, the big plan is to run some analyses and look at everything from different habitat and water quality variables um, to even the different sizes and engineering of the wetland units and how that relates to uh, the abundance of mosquitoes and the abundance of macroinvertebrates and macroinvertebrate predators of mosquitoes and you know see, see what relationships are really out there and what ecological dynamics in terms of predator-prey interactions and community uh, interactions are going on within these different wetland types. Um, but to do that, we'll, we'll do an analysis, but we're going to do another year of hard data collection after this year. We'd like one more uh, hard year on that. Uh, and then we'll see what we find there and if that sparks any more questions or uh, helps us inform the next piece. So, you know, my project's integrated wetland management, meaning there's different aspects of it from moisture seed to wood ducks to the bugs. Um, but being that the bugs is the foundational piece, um, there's also an adaptive management framework piece to this where as I say, learning while doing. Um, so we're gonna do another hard year of data collection, see what we find out, see what more questions we have, and then in years three or four, we may try to scale back or 
do different aspects of uh, or changes to some of the wetland units that we've already uh, analyzed in these past two years and try to see what nuts and bolts we can tweak and see what relationships change. And then after that, year five is technically when I'll be wrapping up and uh, defending my thesis uh, over this entire project. But in terms of the longevity of the project, I know uh, Paul really wants to see this go on to, to develop more research projects for other grad students. And again, it's an adaptive project. So even though I'll finish up in year five, the idea is that we'll continue to learn while doing and continue to uh, improve upon the wetland management techniques for many other years to come. So thanks for tuning in and uh, stay tuned for the next video. We didn't talk much about it today, but essentially we're going to go over the downstream benefits to waterfowl and other wetland species from the types of management that we're trying to employ out here at Birdhaven Ranch.